Well, good day and welcome to the fourth installment, Dialogues with Doug, where we explore where and how the multifamily industry can play a meaningful role in opening doors of opportunity for people of color and for minority owned businesses that serve our sector. Now, previously, we've talked with Daryl Carter, who is the founder and CEO of Avanath Capital Management and former chair of NMHC, and Tammy Jones, who is the founder and CEO of Basis Investment Group and the current chair of Reese, about the importance of having a plan for economic inclusion with emphasis on diversifying discretionary spending to include minority firms and opening up access to both capital and credit for those same companies. Daryl and Tammy were followed by Jeff Hayward and Marcus Cole of Fannie Mae, who covered their company's partnership with the Urban League to identify college students of color for an internship program with apartment firms. The program is called Future Housing Leaders, and it's gone over 300 uh, paid internships this summer and has a goal of a thousand year, a thousand internships a year, which I think is eminently achievable. Today, we're going to explore another facet of what we call the uh, talent pipeline, and that's the C-suite and boards of directors. And um, we fortunately have two very exemplary companies to, on which I'd like to shine a light for their work. And they are Camden Property Trust and CBRE. Representing Camden uh, is their co-founder, Rick Campo, who has served as chairman and CEO since taking the company public in 1993. And with his, with his co-founder, COO Keith Oden, Rick has overseen Camden's progression um, to become one of the industry's largest owners and one of the more prominent REITs, and as noteworthy, uh, to be consistently recognized by Fortune Magazine as one of the most admired companies in the United States in the publication's annual listing of best places to work. On a personal note, and Rick knows this, I'm very indebted to him for his chairmanship of NMHC during the tumultuous years of 2008 and 2009, where his steady hand really helped us go through those choppy waters. We're also pleased to have with us today, Tim Disman, who is Chief Diversity Officer of CBRE. Tim serves on the 12 member global executive team of the world's largest commercial real estate services and investment firm. CBRE has over 100,000 employees who serve customers and investors via 530 offices worldwide. Before taking over his current role, Tim was president of the South Division of CBRE's Global Workforce Solutions Enterprise business, where he oversaw a team of 5,000 professionals serving customers in the US and Latin America, as well as a global portfolio of over 820 million square feet. And Tim has been an executive with CBRE since 2009. So with that background, let's start. And Rick, I'd like to start with you uh, and ask you a series of questions, and then the same will go to Tim. Um, your firm has been an early adopter of change in our industry, and so it shouldn't have been a surprise that Camden was way ahead of the pack in diversifying your board of directors. So what spurred you to push this change, Rick? Well, uh, the first thing uh, that spurred us was we thought it was the right thing to do because uh, part of the equation uh, that, that we, when we started thinking about our board, we thought about our employee base. And when you think about our employee base, uh, it is very diverse. Uh, we have um, more women than men, a very diverse uh, uh, group of people as well. And we, we, when you think about sort of the, the company itself and the, the rank and file employees are diverse, our customers are also very diverse. So when a customer comes in to, to a Camden apartment and they, they see people that look like them and talk like them and are like them, uh, it, it's a more comfortable you know, experience for them. And then, so we started thinking about that at the board level. There was definitely discussion you know, with ESG type of, type of uh, situations, but this was, we, we, we diversified, started diversified our, diversified our board over 10 years ago. And so, um, Early on, it was just about trying to make the board look more like the people in the company. And then, because uh, it, it started out as um, our board was pretty much, you know, 10 white males, uh, primarily because a lot of the board members came from mergers, and that's sort of the pool that we had. Um, uh, even though uh, even though I, I do uh, uh, 
take a lot of pride in my in my immigrant heritage from my my grandparents and uh, on the on my father's side who immigrated from Spain. Uh, but but with that said, um, it was just something we thought at the right time for the right thing to do, and and it was the right thing to do. It's been great for us uh, over time. Uh, I will tell you uh, that it was complicated to start with, and I know we're going to kind of get into some of those questions here in a minute. Um, and, and I'll, I'll give you some of those uh, complications that we have, uh, you know, when we get a little further in. Well, Rick, I mean, how did you, did you use, uh, did you do, do networking or did you use a search firm or a combination of that, that? Or how did you go about recruiting? So we did a combination of, of, of uh, just referrals, people we knew and um, people that we knew from other board members that, that uh, sat on Cam Cameron's board at the time. And then we also, uh, used a recruiting firm as well uh, to to try to broaden the net, uh, and then then uh, we we uh, so it was a combination of the two two uh, two things. And I I think we ended up with so we have uh, you know really diverse or four four really diverse board members today out of our out of our uh, our ten, and two of which were personal referrals uh, from board members and others. And the other two were were um, recruited uh, outside the company via recruiting firms. And what what is a uh, a more diverse board meant to Camden? And, and I, I will include in that question any feedback you got from the analyst and investor community as you as you went forward with this initiative. Uh, so uh, I think what it really means for Camden is that uh, that that uh, uh, we get just a very diverse opinions. We get very diverse. Um, you know, sort of uh, uh, ideas, and uh, you know, we recruited from outside real estate, so we had we had uh, uh, some really interesting, some really interesting board members that could give us different perspectives, like on consumer behavior, on technology, on uh, uh, you know, the sort of millennials coming up, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, so we get a, a really great sort of, uh, of just different view than you would from somebody who's in the apartment industry, I think. Um, and that's all, that, that's their sort of source of, of their experience. Um, in terms of, but I think it's broader than just the, the boardroom experience. Uh, it's also, it also has had the ability to really motivate and enhance our, our, our uh, rank and file teams at Camden because uh, we, we uh, uh, engage our board members a lot in our company events. So we have them come to our, our Camden management conferences, our, our ACE awards, uh, which are company events that, that, that uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, celebrate, you know, all that's Camden. And so when, when you have, uh, you know, African-American male or a Hispanic woman or an Indian American, you know, uh, Indian woman uh, standing up speaking to the, gr to the groups, they they see people that look like them. They act, you know, and they they really engage in that. They're like, wow, you know, this is really cool. I mean, people that that uh, I never thought would be in positions like that are actually in positions like that. And so it really uh, helps our culture, and it and it creates a a more a bigger bond between uh, the company employees and the board. And I think that's really important. Thanks very much, Rick. Tim. We'll switch to you for you've worked with uh, with and for uh, CBRE CEO Bob Zelentic and uh, uh, when he took over at the very end of 2012 as CEO what did CBRE's board of directors look like? Doug, uh, our board has 11 members and there were nine men and two women. That was the the way it is now Tim or the way it was? That's the way it was. Uh, so today uh, we have, uh, it's uh, still 11 board members, six of which are diverse. So just about 55% diverse. So we went from 20% in, well, 18 in 2012 to 55 in 2019. And the same question as I posed to Rick. I mean, how did you go about doing? How did Bob go about doing it? Did he uh, did he do a combination of referrals and search firms, or how did he go about it? Yeah. Well, the, first, let me start off saying the decision to create more diversity on the board was very intentional. Bob and the entire board of directors made it a priority. They developed a plan and committed to getting it done. It didn't happen overnight, as you know, but we made good progress 
year over year. This was partially enabled by several tenured board members deciding to retire, as well as the board adopting term limits in 2015. So as this occurred, the board took deliberate efforts to create more diversity by identifying talented women and professionals of color that would be strong board members. So uh, in, in terms of how, it, it was uh, a very active um, recruiting effort that leveraged primarily board relationships uh, as well as some relationships on, on the, the Global Executive Committee. And the same question as I asked Rick, what, what is a, a more diverse board meant to CBRE? Is there any yeah. unexpected bits that came from that? Or? Well, two things, what it means, we just fundamentally believe that diversity is essential to executing on our strategy as well as delivering sustainable growth. Uh, our, each board member brings a unique perspective. Uh, they're well-informed, highly engaged with our business, and collectively they, they provide a great holistic view uh, that better positions us for continued success. Some of the unexpected benefits um, I was presently surprised by how much our board has engaged with our employees. So um, it's a very similar story. Uh, it, for example, Reggie Gilliard participated recently in a town hall on racial inequity. Uh, we had over 7,000 employees. He candidly spoke about his life experiences as an African American, and it was well received and very uplifting. For our folks, uh, me included. Uh, Jerry Lopez will be participating in a town hall uh, later this month. He's doing that in connection with our Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, again, those are just two well, examples. I, Having that engagement has been incredibly important. Great, great. Rick, did you want to, any other observations before we switch over to the C suite? Did you want any? Uh, you mentioned. You had asked earlier about analysts and shareholders, and yes, we yeah. get a term of that. And and I would say that uh, you know uh, Camden won a uh, an award for diversity at at uh, NARIT, uh, just this past uh, year, and uh, and I think that we we have got a lot received a lot of uh, positive feedback from folks about about uh, you know making those efforts. And and I, I will you know echo what Tim said. It was very intentional and deliberate. And it wasn't easy to start with. I mean, we did have folks who go, well, yeah, but you, you, people on the board, you said, you know, are you sure you can find people of color and women that actually have the expertise that really we need for our company? And, and, uh, and so we had to kind of drag them to the movie a bit. And then once they, uh, once we, we, we had our, our sort of first uh, uh, couple of board members, they were like, wow. This is really good, and this is better for us, and we do get a totally different perspective. Um, you, you know, to, to Tim's point on town halls, we do those as well. And uh, one of our board members, just to give you a sense, is Renu Couture, who is the uh, chancellor and president of the University of Houston, and she's a uh, you know Indian national um, uh, woman, and she got up and told her story uh, in in one of our uh, flat. We had about 500 Camden people there. And her story is really interesting because she she was in an arranged marriage, uh, sort of forced to come to America in that, uh, and didn't speak English. Uh, went to uh, went she was at um, a university uh, uh, and and uh, you know, told the her story is about how she wanted to be educated, but they didn't really want to educate her in India. She got this education in the U.S. and her husband allowed her to do that. Uh, she learned English by watching the I Love Lucy uh, commercial or I Love Lucy TV and then became one of the she's one of the top 10, you know, university presidents in America today. And and so the point of all that is that, yeah, it does make a big difference. And oftentimes uh, people just don't realize how much the diversity of opinion and the diversity of experience is really get not just color or or you know, women. It's really about their life experience is very different, and and that brings you know value to the overall organization. It makes us a better organization, and ultimately, 
more profitable and more, you know, more uh, progressive in, in all those ways. So uh, I think that's kind of the, the thing I think is really important for people to recognize. It's not just checking the box, right? It's really getting the value from the diverse opinion and diverse experience that makes you better, makes you a better person and makes you a better uh, board or better company overall. Uh, because, you know, when you think about the world in the next 20 years, you know, we're, we're, it's going to be a, more, a massively more diverse world. And, you know, the, the majority is not going to be white males. It's going to be people of color and women. Tim, uh, you know, I guess you both really have to keep your eyes on institutional investors. Um, they're important to your, your well-being, but aren't they now also asking a lot more questions about ESG and about about diversity and your um, both your board and your senior management teams? Tim, isn't that the case that you guys see too? It's Go ahead. something that I'm interested in and had a session with one of our largest investors just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and they specifically wanted to know about what our diversity and inclusion efforts were and how important that was to our business. Very topical. So let's shift gears to the C-suite if we can. And, and Tim, you're obviously a walking example of uh, diversity in the C-suite. Uh, but I also know from discussions with some of your senior team on the multifamily side um, that you're very keenly interested in seeing even more diversity um, in, in the C-suite. Um, so what, what are your challenges in promoting women and professionals of color into the C-suite? And, you know, an ancillary question is including feeder positions that will feed into that C-suite um, as opportunities arise. Yeah. So our, as you mentioned, Doug, our global executive committee has 12 members, four of us are divorced, uh, excuse me, diverse. Uh, so we've made good progress, but um, you know, we, we still have some work to do. It'll continue to be a focus for us. Uh, things that uh, are top of mind are uh, actions relative to creating a robust succession planning process, as well as uh, we have several internal leadership development programs and uh, you know, part of the challenge or the biggest challenge is just the pace of change. Um, these things take time, but it also requires commitment from the top, um, coming up with creative ways of solutioning and funding those initiatives, and then of course, execution. We have continued to talk about um, providing additional visibility um, so we understand um, what's taking place, not just at the 12 global executive committee, but those feeder positions as well. It's just going down, um, providing capability both systemically as well as through programs uh, is incredibly important and then driving accountability. Um, we have to understand how we're doing our baseline, um, what our goals are, and execute it against it and hold one another accountable for those outcomes. Rick, same question to you about um, the challenges of promoting women and, and uh, professionals of color into the C-suite or into those feeder positions. Sure, so yeah, I, I agree with Tim in the sense that it, that it's a, uh, it can be a, a complicated and long process. Uh, it just takes time, right? Because one of the challenges is uh, as you, as people have grown up in a business, uh, we have incredible tenure at Camden. So I have employees that have been here for, you know, 15, 20, 25 years. And, and so the challenge you have is how do you, how do you make, create those feeder positions? And then how do you, uh, how do you, how do you maybe unbundle certain positions so that you can give people opportunity, you know, to, to move up uh, and to get more experience. Uh, and the way we've approached it is that, so we have sort of two big pieces, one on the C-suite side, but we also want to make sure that in our vice president areas that we have good good um, uh, leadership ladders there for, for uh, folks, uh, diverse folks as well. Uh, one of the key things we did just recently in the last year is we, um, we separated uh, and changed uh, titles of long, very long-term people. 
in order to create space. And I think that's what people need to think through when you start thinking about, okay, I've got all these tenured employees and, 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 and if you look below them or to the side of them, how do you make space for them to kind of, you know, A, get experience and B, get exposure to the, to the uh, C-suite level. Uh, so what we did at Camden is uh, you, had, you had made a comment or introduced Keith as the COO, right? Keith Odin, who's the co-founder of Camden. He's the den in Camden. I'm the Cam in, or the, again, get my finger right here. So, so bottom line is uh, we, we, so Keith became the executive vice chairman. That's a mouthful, right? What does that mean, right? That means he's an old dude that we need to give a good, you know, <laughs> title to because he's still really running the company along with me as the, as the chairman and CEO. But what that allowed us to do was to promote, promote Malcolm Stewart to president and then to, and then to uh, elevate Lori Baker, who, who uh, is a major player at uh, NMHC by design. Uh, years ago, we brought Lori in. So Lori um, is now executive vice president, uh, and she's one of, of, I think, three or executive vice presidents. And so we have this space that we created. So I think it's important to have a, a long-term strategic plan on how you're going to do it. How are you going to really provide you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in your company? And we have a written plan with an executive committee that oversees it, a, a, a full-time person that focuses on the issues. And we also have a, a smaller group that's, that is uh, more, more uh, we call it the Inclusion Council. And that's made up of people that are that are not necessarily vice presidents, but they're maybe in that vice president kind of next to vice president category. And they deal with real specific issues about training programs and, and programs getting, getting uh, people of, of color and, and women um, into the areas where they can get more experience and more leadership skills and things like that. So it's a really specific program and and handle both at the executive level and at the at our vice president level to try to raise up folks. Uh, we also are, are, are doing a fair amount of recruiting um, in uh, colleges uh, and trying to find people not necessarily with real estate experience, but just really smart people and trying to in, in, in enhance, you know, the idea of you should come to work in real estate and here's why it's great. So we, we, we have some really good success, you know, recruiting out of colleges and then they have some some really cool people that have been around now maybe ten years, and they're they're very uh, you know you know they're upwardly upwardly mobile, and they and we've sort of grown them from within. So I think that's an important part as well. Well, before I turn to you, Tim, I just wanted to just pass on a little anecdote from my own background, and that was with Fannie Mae when we um, we got to a point where we went from twenty five percent turnover when I got there with the team, we get we get down to five percent. Uh, turnover per year and uh, mm -hmm. you, we had problems of longevity we had uh, people did not want to leave and so what we did there was simply um, create opportunities totally out of the box opportunities for women and minorities to take on assignments that are not typecast and um, it really helped us build a, a, a team and a bench um, because then they could move into positions um, one of them you know is ken bacon uh, that we recruited in, you know, from uh, from the Resolution Trust Corporation, where he was securitizing mortgages and uh, put him in charge of one of the regional offices. So, anyway, th that's another way of, of tackling it. Tim, um, you have a hundred thousand employees, and one would think all, you know, you have unlimited capacity to challenge people <laughs> and so on. But you've got your own challenges, I'm sure. And and uh, how how are you tackling it? along the lines of what Rick just talked about. Yeah, uh, so a number of things. First, let me um, start with, I think, which is the, it's the easy and hard answer, but we're a growth company. I, and if we continue to double our business every five years or so, there's gonna be lots of room for incremental growth. Uh, and we're, we're very focused and that's part of our strategy. Uh, our goal, is clearly to hire top talent, right? No, no ands, ifs, or buts. And we've made improvements to our hiring practices, uh, which are consistent with that, goal, with that goal. So for example, I just wanna talk about one, for all director and above level positions, we require a diverse interview panel. And this means that 
there's now a diverse team that participates in the hiring decision. This makes the process more fair and increases the likelihood that we are gonna get the best candidate for the job. Um, so um, it wasn't said here, and some circles will say, well, are we compromising on talent? We absolutely are not. Uh, we've got a, a very fair process, um, and we know it works because it has led to increased diverse hires over the past year. Um, we're looking to expand and accelerate that process for this year. Um, that's just one example. Um, there, there are a few more. Uh, we specifically have hired diversity recruiters, and these are individuals that um, are focused on sourcing, uh, creating um, uh, larger pipelines of talent from different areas uh, at all different levels uh, in order to feed into our recruiting process. Uh, just a, a stack from last year alone, um, we've created almost 3,000 diverse candidates. Uh, that seems like a lot, but you know, not nearly enough. Um, and we're gonna continue to ramp and accelerate that program um, to, to bring in more diverse talent. We also have some co-funding cool initiatives. Uh, so uh, some additional dollars to bring in uh, those key talents uh, that are diverse into much needed positions. And then uh, we also have a leveraged an employee referral program through our employee resource groups. So just a number, I mean, I'm just naming a few that I think have made a big difference uh, in, in creating a more diverse organization, especially within certain positions and certain levels. Lots of work to do still, but making good progress. And, you know, the, the, the brokerage business has been a tough one to, to diversify. And, and so you're, you're talking about these programs now, these are funneling women and uh, men and women of color into those positions um, throughout the organization. Yeah, well, so there are three programs uh, specifically tied around funding. Two are specifically focused on producer or brokerage positions. Uh, so one is more general, two are very specific. Um, recognizing that uh, it's, it's been a little bit more challenging and we have more opportunity in that particular area. So Rick, in, in terms of uh, the, that level of director and VP and so on, when, you, when you're able to get women and, and, and professionals of color up, uh, to that level, are there any specific programs or plans that you have to retain and develop uh, that talent? Is it, um, talk a bit about that if you could. Sure, absolutely. It, absolutely, we have a, a program for that. I mean, we, we don't have 100,000 people. We only have 1,700 and, and uh, you know, 400 and plus or minus in our sort of management or but uh, and so we, we do have a little less of, a, of, of an ability to move people into, into broader slots, right, with that, with that fewer uh, people. But, but I think fundamentally the, the way we do it is we, we uh, focus on uh, training programs. We, we, the key is recruiting the right people at the right time. And then it's making sure that, that, um, that we have a platform to follow those, those folks and to make sure that they're getting the type of leadership skills that they need, that they're getting the broadening of their base. You know, we've had people, for example, go from HR into, you know, operations and from operations into, uh, into finance. And, and so the idea is to try to cross pollinate these and, and, and create opportunities for people to go into various areas to get a more broad uh, sort of uh, uh, leadership skills and, and technical skills uh, with respect to Camden. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, and this is kind of an interesting, uh, when you think about how do you track it, how do you manage it? Because with, 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 even with, with a, a small company like 1,700 people compared to Tim's, you, you know, people get lost, right? I mean, if, if I need a, a, a somebody that, that I, I have a position open in Tampa, for example, at my regional office there, and there's a really cool, great person that has that 
expertise to do that in Houston or in Southern California, but how do you know, right? And so uh, what we what we um, have done over the last two years and and the you know pre-pandemic, uh, we called and I won't use the name of the of the company because I think I'm I can't, but we had this two-year implementation of a cloud-based um, you know system that included a major HR piece, which was talent management which basically allows us to, so we spent two years, it was supposed to be a one year, $10 million project, and it turned into two years and $23 million, and lots of pain and suffering. And then all of a sudden pandemic hits, and, and all of a sudden we're in the cloud and it's all working and everybody can pull up you know, HR forms on their cell phone and life is good. Uh, so that program uh, has a talent piece, and it's interesting because we, what we do is we manage where people are, and then in the talent piece, you can actually see, uh, you know, where they are in their leader, in their strategy, in their leadership, and and I think part of that equation is following people and making sure they're on track, and then helping them move from different track to another track, and and so I think that so the part of the equation is managing the data of who you have and where they are, and potentially being able to move them in different places, and I think that's part of the part of the equation that that uh, that really is going to help us you know create a lot more uh, pathways for diverse candidates to do really well in Camden. So Tim uh, do you when you look at that universe of talent that you're you're drawing into CBRE you're you're, you're working with them you're, you're you're developing them do you do you have a systematic way of tracking uh, with built-in accountabilities uh, as for the managers and supervisors of those of those folks? Um, we do in several ways. I think if, if the question is, can it be improved? Yes, um, but we are driving accountability uh, through, I'll say, uh, at least through training and succession planning through our LMS. Uh, we have Talent Coach. Uh, and uh, that's been a great tool for our employees. We also have uh, a recruiting system um, where we're, we're able to post understand status uh, and track through that process. So uh, yes, those are in place, but I think those are some of the, um, right, just the systemic areas where we can make some changes that will benefit us in years to come. And we are looking at making those additional investments. So one final area to probe before you all go back to your day jobs. Um, so very few people you know, graduate from college with a real estate degree, and then fewer still with any sort of degree in multifamily housing. Um, so we have to compete for people coming out thinking I'm going to be the next Bill Gates, I'm going to be the next whatever uh, in the tech business, or I'm going to be uh, one of the big movers and shakers on Wall Street. Are you finding it? Harder, easier, somewhere in between to to recruit talent out of college today for this business, for the multifamily business. Rick, can I start with you? Uh, the answer is no. We we, we are. Uh, I guess if you if you said, do I am I getting the the uh, do I go and uh, you know recruit at at, at uh, you know Ivy League schools for you know entry level um, you know multifamily? I think the answer is no. And, uh, and I, I, I do think that we, we are at a disadvantage to tech and some of the more sexy, you know, uh, uh, industries. Uh, but, but fundamentally, we are not having any problem um, doing, uh, you know, recruiting out of colleges. Uh, we have a very robust intern program. We don't just hire, uh, you know, friends of family for, for our, uh, or anything like that. It's really a very specifically designed program. Uh, that we bring interns in, uh, we put them in lots of different positions, uh, both from construction to you know property management, finance, and all that. And the objective is to hire those interns when they're out of school. And, and so it's really a job interview kind of thing, um, more than more than it is a it, you know interns really cost you time and effort <laughs> in terms of their productivity, really. And so it's more about about. Uh, recruiting and getting them into Camden. And I, I'll give you a great example of a, a recruit we had. We recruited out of uh, out of um, I think it was West Virginia, or, uh, and uh, out of D. Person came in as a leasing 
uh, leasing agent or leasing person as an intern, as a um, intern became a um, what we call manager in development right out of school, and now is a regional vice president at 30 years old in Southern California, and doing really really well. And so, and, and you know, I didn't have a real estate degree, uh, you know, just kind of a general business degree. So I, I think that we have the ability to to uh, the key is being to recruit. The key is you you have to be intentional about it. You can't just go now and then, you have to have a program that makes sense and then you have to recruit the folks and then deal with, make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're doing all the right things to enhance their ability to want to come to work for you. Uh, and I, and the, the idea behind it, and, we are, and it's mostly probably half diverse in terms of, um, of the folks that come in uh, and, and you have to follow them. The other, I think, big thing we, we do is uh, we, we create mentor programs where even when they go back to school to finish their final year, we have people communicating with them on an ongoing basis to make sure that they remember that they had a great experience at Camden so we can, in fact, recruit them in the future. That's great. Tim, just your, your thoughts on that area? Just about. I'm sure. I, I think you've heard Rick and I both um, talk about the intentionality, the importance of being intentional um and being committed right if, if you're focused you state the goal and you you aggressively pursue it it's going to put you in a great position uh, we feel that our culture and our brand uh, puts us in a really good position um, to be very competitive and uh, recruiting and bringing in top talent uh, both from you know high schools and expanding that reach to colleges, to business schools, even in um, attracting professionals in different uh, industries, whether it's financial services or, or insurance, um, we, we get a wide selection uh, of great talented folks interested. Uh, and when you're you know, a, a fortune, we're 128 now, we're, we've been a most admired company, um, you know, by Fortune and Forbes, it just puts us in a good position. We're going to continue to invest uh, in our culture, building that pipeline and bringing in great talent uh, that is reflective of the clients that we serve, um, what our shareholders, uh, what our investors uh, and, and what our leadership is asking us to do. Right? It's, it's more than just the right thing to do uh, for our people. It's the right thing to do for business and to drive great results for our company. So uh, I'm, I'm aligned with Rick and your experience too, Doug, that it's just getting that top talent, um, continuing to focus on how you bring them in is critically important. So let me uh, end on that note. I want to thank both of you for your time, for your insights, um, and wish you well on the what remains of this summer. Um, not much left of it, but um, let's enjoy it. So thanks very much for being with us today.